Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Good evening, afternoon or morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Tim Hollow from the Australian Green Institute, and thanks so much for joining us at the Global Greens Connecting for Green Action Congress, which has been fantastic so far. Um, and to join this session on democratic ecologies from the grassroots to the tree canopy with Maggie Chapman from the Scottish Greens, Rabina Nanyunja from the African Green Federation, Jonathan Shree from the Australian Greens and Laura Lopez from Catalonia en Comú and the Spanish Greens. Um, on that note, let me firstly um, note that wonderfully we have simultaneous translation for this session into Spanish. Um, and back into English. So for those who need Spanish um, now, you should see a button at the bottom of your screen to make that available. Um, and when Laura is speaking later, for those of us who need English, we, we will use that button. And I will um, point that out again at that point um, to have the translation back into English. And thank you so much to our brilliant translators um, instantaneous translation is an extraordinary skill um, and to the Global Greens for providing that important service. Uh, now, before we go any further, let me do an important thing for Australians and acknowledge that like a number of others on this call, I'm joining from stolen Aboriginal land. I live and work and play on lands which the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people have stewarded with love and care for countless generations and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and those still to come. I acknowledge their deep and ongoing connection with this land and the fact that they have never ceded sovereignty over it. Indeed, as I've come to understand through the privilege of learning from First Nations people, the idea of ceding sovereignty over land is for them nonsense, because in the indigenous understanding of the world, country owns us, not the other way around. Where Western political economy is driven and underpinned by the idea and practice of possession of land, control of land, and the animals and plants and people of the land, Indigenous thinking is grounded in true interdependence, mutuality, and respect. I say that in some detail because I believe this is also not coincidentally, not surprisingly, the core of green politics. When we talk about our four pillars, ecological stewardship, economic and social justice, peace and nonviolence, and the topic of this discussion, grassroots democracy, we're talking, I think, about cultivating systems of interdependence, mutuality and respect. This is something we're committed to internally through our use of consensus decision-making processes, of course, where when it works well, our members all have the opportunity to be heard and to participate in deliberative discussions, informing our policies, our strategies, and our tactics. And it's something we work for in the world around us, seeking to open decision-making to everyone. We do this because it's the right thing to do, but also because we know it works. We know that it's how we get decisions for the common good for the long term. When decision-making is centrally controlled, when power is held by a few and the voices of the wealthy and powerful drown out the voices of the many, we get bad decisions which put everything else at risk, which make it impossible to achieve social justice, peace and ecological sustainability. As our experience and the detailed research of people like Eleanor Ostrom has shown, when people get to take part in well-managed democratic processes, when we build systems of mutual trust and respect, such as those that Indigenous people did, people make good decisions together. But as we work towards that goal as a political party, pretty much everywhere in today's world, we're doing so within political and economic systems that are based on possession, domination and control. And that's what we're here to discuss today with our excellent panel and in conversation with them and you. Greens parties have always believed in principle in grassroots democracy, devolving power to the community and ensuring as many people as possible are involved in decision making. I say in principle because there's always been a definite spectrum of commitment to this pillar inside the party. And now increasingly we're involved in governing cities, regions and whole countries. And along with top-down governing comes a tendency to centralising control and exercising the coercive power that government holds. 
especially when governing in coalition with parties that don't subscribe to our grassroots consensus view of politics. This is a tension the party must navigate, and I believe we would be really well advised to discuss it in the open. Alongside this explicit tension in the party is the existence of growing conversations about democratic innovation all around the world, from Barcelona to Kurdistan to here in Australia and all around the globe, developing new ways for communities to retain control of decision making and for governments to facilitate and enable community level leadership. So how can Greens in governments, in parliaments and operating in communities work together to transform how government works, dissolving coercive power and distributing the capacity to co-determine our own futures as widely as possible across communities? And how can the global Greens provide linkages and networks to ensure that the lessons for these activities are spread across the globe and even form part of the superstructure of globalized localism? We're gonna be led in this conversation today by four presentations by practitioners before having a Q&A and discussion. We'll hear first from Maggie Chapman, MSP, about how the Scottish Greens are navigating the tension between governing and grassroots democracy. Then Jonathan Shree will share some of his experiences running participatory processes as a councillor on Brisbane City Council and his thoughts on managing the tension. Robina Nanyunja from the African Greens Federation will then present on the importance of community networks influencing governments and Greens working across both and the contrast between centralizing populist radicalism and grassroots democracy of the Greens. And finally, Laura Lopez will talk to us about how Barcelona in Comú is governing from the grassroots, changing the way government operates, devolving and dissolving power. Please, of course, have a think about questions along the way, post them in the chat on Zoom or in Hoover, um, and I can put them to the panel after everyone's spoken, or you can seek the floor in the discussion after the panel to share ideas or experiences or proposals. And we'll try to bring the conversation around to how we might work with the Global Greens and our continental federations and our individual parties to facilitate an ongoing discussion about this question. So without further ado, let's get started. And I'll hand over now to Maggie Chapman, Maggie is the Scottish Green Party MSP for North East Scotland and the Green spokesperson for justice, equalities and human rights, economy, international development and social security. She's vice convener of the Scottish Parliament's Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee, a member of the Economy and Fair Work Committee and a member of the Scottish Parliament corporate body. A former Edinburgh local councillor, she's been involved in participatory budgeting and much more. Over to you, Maggie. Thanks so much. Good morning. Uh, greetings from a rather chilly Scotland uh, to you all. Thank you very much for that introduction, Tim, and thank you very much for inviting me to contribute to the session today. As Tim has said, I am one of the uh, seven Green MSPs in the Scottish Parliament, and I thought I'd begin today by giving a little bit of background about how the Scottish Parliament is elected, providing a little bit of context for the different players in the parliament and an overview of the, the political scene here. Um, before I talk about the cooperation agreement that we as the Scottish Green Group have with the Scottish National Party Scottish Government. So the Scottish Parliament was established in 1999 following a devolution referendum. It comprises 129 seats. Um, 128 of which become the, the daily routine decision makers. We elect one, one, of our, one from our number to be the presiding officer. Um, so of those 129, 73 come from constituencies, 56 from lists across eight regions. And this additional member system was designed, it is said, to prevent any one party from gaining a majority, thus embedding and creating a system with cooperation deeply, deeply embedded within it. And in the first three terms from 1999 to 2011, the government has had been a coalition, a formal coalition between the Scottish Labour Party and the Scottish Liberal Democrats. The other parties, the Scottish Conservatives, Scottish National Party, Scottish Greens, and, and a couple of others had representation. And the, the five parties that I've mentioned have all been represented since 1999. Um, 
Conservatives, the SNP, Scottish National Party and the Greens were in opposition, direct opposition for, for those first three terms. However, in 2011, the Scottish National Party, the SNP, won 69 seats. The single party majority led by Alex Salmond had stood on a platform of holding an independence referendum. And they negotiated that with the UK government, led at the time by the Conservatives, David Cameron. And the referendum was set for September 2014. The SNP's prospectus for independence started out in 2012 as continuity neoliberalism, not very much change from the status quo. It felt like things as they are now, just better because we'll be independent. The financial crash had not really started to bite most people, but the, auster the austerity agenda from Cameron's UK government was something to argue against and say Scotland could do better. And it was independence that gave the Scottish Greens and other pro-independence parties and groups a platform that we'd never had before. All of a sudden, the SNP saw, saw themselves and their nice, safe, continuity neoliberalism being outflanked on the left with popular and radical ideas and visions of what an independent Scotland could look like, being put forward by the Greens, by socialists, by community activists and others. And the SNP changed their stance on a number of things, like on immigration. They definitely softened, or at least felt less certain about their position on things like currency and the monarchy. Ideas like universal basic income had their first proper airing. The radical independence vision was exciting, new, positive, and full of hope. And it was that, I think, that got the independence vote to 45%. Not quite enough, but definitely closer than the complacent UK government had expected. Unionists may have won that battle, but it definitely felt like the independence campaign had won the war. In 2016, Greens saw their representation in Holyrood go from two seats to six, largely as a consequence of the improved platform and increased visibility of, a, of our radical ideas that the independence campaign had given us. People understood much more clearly what Greens stood for and they liked it. In that 2016 election campaign, perhaps in response to increasing support for the Greens, the SNP, seeing us as their primary competitor, sought to create an antagonism with the Conservatives. This meant marginalizing the Greens and their electoral strategy, the SNP's strategy, was designed to keep us out. But it didn't work as well as they'd hoped. And in that five year parliamentary session, it was clear that they would get more done that was more popular with the pro-independence electorate if they worked with Greens rather than shifted back to the right. As a minority government, they had to rely on Greens to get many things, including their budgets passed. And that mean, meant Greens could build on our radical platform, things like free bus travel for, 20, for under 22s, which came in last Monday and the like being key to budget approval. But that five year term was not a very happy one. The shadow of the independence referendum, the EU referendum, which led to the disaster that is Brexit, and then the COVID pandemic made for a very negative, antagonistic and confrontational atmosphere in the parliament. Remember that parliament designed to be about collaboration and cooperation. The SNP had to work with others to get things passed and tensions rose and relationships sprayed. So in 2021, when the SNP got 64 seats, just 50% of the votes, one short of a majority in the parliament, to be assured of winning parliamentary votes, they had to approach another party and they approached the Greens to discuss some kind of cooperation deal. I think that there are potentially two motivating factors here, one more charitable than the other. First, they wanted to be able to get things done with certainty and having the Greens votes in the bank would ensure that. Second, some people might argue that a great way of closing down the space for radical politics would be to bind the party of radical ideas by some kind of government. And so that is where we are. I won't go into the internal processes and discussions within the Scottish Greens that led us to entering negotiations or signing up to the cooperation agreement. And it's a cooperation agreement, not full coalition. But I think it is worth noting here that there are significant things that we expect to happen in Scotland over this parliamentary session because of the deal we struck. First, we will see much delayed reform to 
outdated and cruel gender recognition laws. Second, we will see a new deal for tenants, including rent controls and other enhanced rights. And third, we will see a clear investment in just transition away from oil and gas and investment in infrastructure like rail. But these prizes do not come without cost. The challenge for us is and will be to ensure we keep closely connected to our grassroots movements, communities and values. And that is already proving challenging. Two of our seven MSPs are junior government ministers and therefore bound by collective responsibility. We cannot vote against the government except on things we know we disagree on. These are specified in our cooperation agreement. That means we vote for things we might otherwise not support, or we do not vote for other opposition party pos positions where we, where we not bound by the deal we might support. We are still learning. Of the seven MSPs in our group, four of us are new. We've never been in, in government before as a party, and the SNP Scottish government is also learning. They need to engage with us in a way they've never had to engage with any other party. They need to share information, something that's really, really hard for a culturally centralizing party. And the civil service is having to learn. They are having to develop a culture of openness and collaboration that I think is fair to say is completely new to most of them. And while all this learning is happening, decisions have to be made, including very tough budget decisions, spending reviews and the like. Culture change takes time and many decisions can't wait for that. So our challenge is to, in the words of Podemos, have one foot in parliament while keeping the other on the streets. For the five of us who are not ministers, that means I think being very clearly rooted in the communities we represent. And that's hard. Green MSPs all represent regions, meaning populations between 450,000 and 790,000 people, with sizes ranging from a large city in Glasgow to a region in the Highlands and Islands that's larger than Belgium. So being rooted in community is difficult. The five of us non-ministers are also trying to cover everything between us, so our portfolio workload is significant. And we need to ensure we keep our radicalism while, whilst also being in government. That is the tension. One way of doing this is to keep close to and be part of the radical social movements. We have a good record of standing alongside climate activists, trade unionists and anti-austerity campaigners, and we need to find ways of continuing this. This is challenging. Because of the agreement, we won't always be able to get what the movements want in terms of social security asks, improvements in paying conditions for public sector workers or job creation strategies. We know we can build on things like citizens assemblies, which is something that Greens uh, brought into the political space in Scotland, but we still aren't doing those really effectively enough yet. If we can emerge in, uh, at the end of this term with a similar number of seats and having secured significant policy change and the beginnings of, ser of a serious response to the twin crises of the economy and climate, we will have done well and we will have learned a lot. We are caught between the urgent need for radical change and the structures that make that change difficult. For other parties, big in power has resulted in little change and electoral decline. We must hope that we can avoid that same ending and that our efforts will be rewarded with the change we all so desperately need. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maggie. Um, fantastic, informative, thoughtful presentation. And there's already quite a few questions flowing in the chat. Um, so thank you so much, and we'll come back to you. Um, I'll hand over now to Jonathan Shree, who is one of 26 city councillors on Brisbane City Council, and the first Greens representative elected to a government body within the state of Queensland. For the past five years, Jono has experimented with different forms of participatory decision making at the local level, and is passionate about ensuring that Greens members use deliberative democratic processes to insulate against the corrupting influence of power and remain connected to grassroots struggles. John O, thank you, take it away. Thank you, thank you so much for having me, Tim. It's an honor and a privilege to be part of this discussion. Thanks to Maggie for those comments as well. I'm like to acknowledge that I'm coming at you from the occupied territories of the Yagura and Turtle people in so-called Brisbane. And I wanna pay respects to their elders past and present, recognizing that sovereignty was never ceded and that the struggle for Indigenous sovereignty needs to be at the foreground of green politics and, and something that we really centre in all of our discussions. 
So I've, um, yeah, I'm proposing to talk a little bit about some of the practical trials we've we've had over the past few years of different forms of participatory decision making and reflect a little bit on some of the limitations and what's worked, what hasn't worked. I've just also posted in the chat a quick summary of some context of Brisbane City Council. So I won't go into too much detail, but there's 1.2 million people in the local government area. There are 26 wards, each represented by a councillor who's elected through optional preferential voting. There's, crucially though, there, there are 19 Liberal National Party councillors out of the 26. So I'm the only Greens councillor, there's about five Labor councillors, but a strong majority of the council is essentially hard right. Uh, and, and that makes it kind of difficult territory to be operating as the sort of sole Green who's committed to local democracy and that sort of stuff. The, as a councillor, I have, I'm a full-time, it's a full-time role. I have two full-time staff and a modest office and a modest office budget, but that, that does come with, a, I guess, a bit of, uh, a bit of resourcing and a bit of power that we can use strategically. The problem we have is that we, we have this grand goal of es que te, making decisions democratically and es alcanzar... have, I'm sorry to interrupt him I'm just getting a bit of audio from the interpreter on the same channel um we're we getting yes do you have the interpretation on that might explain it I think yeah, I've switched now it off the time being. yeah Thank thanks you. cheers <laughs> my bad um so yeah as I was saying we've got um this grand desire of involving residents in participatory decision making about local government. We want residents to have a say on how their neighbourhoods change and evolve, on how money is spent, on what upgrades are made to local public spaces, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But the majority of the councillors have no interest in that whatsoever. The Liberal National Party is strongly aligned with the private property development industry. And so it's really difficult to you know, get any traction when we're proposing these ideas of collaborative decision making. But I think what's really important to me is that even though we don't have majority power and we don't have the ability to get all those big council decisions to be made democratically that we're still experimenting and still trialing direct democracy and still modeling ways that uh, greens would operate when if we did hold power in government so um i'll share share my screen briefly just to show you one or two examples this is a um a participatory budgeting system we've used for a couple of years now. It's a fairly kind of simple or rudimentary system. I, as a local councillor, I have discretionary control over a public space upgrades budget of just under half a million dollars. Uh, so basically I can decide where the basketball courts go and where the playground upgrades happen um, within some parameters. It's not sort of unlimited power, but most councillors will decide for themselves how to allocate that money. What we do is use a participatory budgeting system inspired by a lot of other cities and um, places that have been doing this for much longer and with much larger budgets. But essentially res residents are able to suggest projects. We see how much those projects are gonna cost. Um, once the um, projects have been costed, residents can vote via this online system to allocate funding towards the projects they like. So you can see here via this green bar at the top, um, I've got an, a budget of 450K to allocate. I can decide to fund certain projects in the list and the green bar at the top will go up and down based on the projects I choose. Um, can people see that okay? Is that, yeah. Um, so this system was actually designed by volunteers. They did an amazing job um, and as you can see, we get a bit of in engagement. People can, in, in addition to voting to allocate funding, they can like things, dislike things. They can make comments on specific projects. Um, so that's one sort of tool that we've used in terms of trying to democratize local decision-making. I'll post links to these particular websites in the chat as well in a second. Um, the other tool we've used is kind of more traditional polling. And similarly, I've, I gen generally use polls for decisions that I have some direct control of. And that's one principle that we kind of try to stick to is that we don't want to waste people's time voting on stuff or being consulted on stuff where they don't actually have kind of some level of binding power. It's quite disempowering for people to be continually filling out council surveys and saying, oh, this is what I want and then to be ignored. So we don't use polls for everything, but we try to use polls for stuff. Um, so this is sort of 
as an example, one current poll that I've got up where, you know, we've got a toilet block proposed for a local park. Um, we're holding a vote. People can vote for or against it. You can see about 300, 350 people have participated. Um, and interestingly, um, people are really getting involved by the comments and like lots of people have strong views and they're like, oh, the toilet block shouldn't have it. Or, we shouldn't, we don't need a toilet in this small park, all that sort of stuff. Um, but as you can see, people are participating. Um, it's a relatively small proportion of the electorate as a whole. Um, but similarly, these are relatively small decisions. Um, we also sometimes use those polls to make decisions on, on larger projects that I don't have full control over. So in that context, this, you know, here's a poll about a bridge proposal, a footbridge proposal. Um, in this case, I didn't have unilateral control over where the bridge gets built or whether the bridge gets built, but I put up a poll to guide how I would vote as a councillor in the chamber and what position I would advocate. And you can see here, we use sort of a preferential voting system where people could select which, um, which location they wanted, or they had the option of no bridge at all, or find a different location. And, you know, about 700 people are participating. And again, people really, some people getting quite engaged with the comments um, and, you know, that process. Um, so I think in some ways, this is a good sign. It shows that people, uh, they, they see value in participating in the process. The interesting challenge we've navigated is to what extent we should be relying on online consultation versus face-to-face -face forums. Obviously, not everyone can get online, not everyone has that access, but uh, similarly, not everyone can get along to public meetings. And in the first few years of our participatory budgeting processes, we did rely more heavily on public forums and wanted to have a really strong emphasis on deliberation and consensus building and taking the time to listen to other people before you cast your vote or form a view. But we tended to find that those meeting, the attendance at those meetings was so low that it was hard to make those decisions binding. They didn't have much legitimacy because in an electorate of 40,000 people, if only 50 people are rocking up to make the decision, that, that doesn't actually feel very democratic. So I guess some reflections or learnings on this so far are that um, people really want to participate. They want to have more of the say, but there's that significant time barrier to participation and um really there's a trade-off to be made between high quality deliberation and people really being engaged and having access to expert information and taking the time to really think through a decision um often via face-to-face -face meetings and in-depth workshops versus uh kind of quick voting via a website or whatever and yeah we've we've increasingly we are tending to rely more heavily on that online voting even though the quality of deliberation is some, is a little bit lower but the participation rates are far higher. And interestingly, with that bridge example I gave before, we did also hold a large public meeting and about 80 people came along and we had a poll at the meeting as well. And at the meeting, about 80% of attendees were strongly opposed to any bridge. But in the online vote, which had about 700 participants, support for the bridge was around 75, 80%. So a complete inversion where people who were really opposed to the bridge were much more motivated to turn up in person. But when we had an online vote that was more widely accessible and that more people were able to easily participate in, there was actually more support for the footbridge. So I guess it again highlights the, the risk or the tendency where if you're using direct democracy or deliberative democracy processes and your sample sizes aren't big enough or there are biases in and barriers in terms of who can participate, um, you might think you're listening to the whole electorate, but you're actually only empowering a vocal minority or you're, you've got a distorted sample there that's not representative of the wider community. So um, really, whether we're talking about local decisions like park upgrades or bigger picture stuff, I think the crucial challenge is around fighting for time. And by that, I mean that the political establishment often imposes really narrow constraints on um, you know, when we have to make a decision by, and this is a deadline, we need an answer, yes or no, will you vote for this, yes or no? And as much as possible as Green representatives, I think we need to resist that tendency um, and push for as much time as possible so we can have these conversations with our community. Uh, because it's not so much about you know, what process or what web platform you use or what kind of workshop style you use. The, the point is that good democratic decision-making takes time. And one of the most obvious ways that I think Greens representatives get co-opted by the 
political establishment and get cornered into, I think, supporting bad proposals is that um, we're forced to make decisions too quickly. And so we end up, um, yeah, acquiescing to the parameters of debate that the main major parties might be set in. So um, I don't think that's a particularly radical insight, but I think it's probably good to remember that if, if we insist on using uh, these slower, more deliberative and participatory forms of decision making, but we're trying to, trying to rush decisions in order to fit the timeframes that the major parties are set in, we can end up, rather than challenging, we can end up legitimising the neoliberal status quo because the major parties might say, you have to choose between option A and option B, and you've got three weeks before the vote happens, therefore make your decision. And then we as Greens reps are panicking and saying, all right, we've got to talk to everyone, everyone in the community, do you want option A or do you want option B? Let's have a poll, let's have a meeting, let's decide option A or option B. And we never think about all the other letters of the alphabet and all those alternative ideas get left behind. And in the end, the community grudgingly votes for option B. And then we as the Greens support option B and then everyone's annoyed because actually option G would have been better. And so um, I guess that's a long way of saying that we really need to be cautious of not getting co-opted by these processes and that um, particularly tools like participatory budgeting aren't used as a fig leaf or a, um, a plank of neoliberalism because say with that park upgrades budget, it's a relatively small component of the Brisbane City Council's $3 billion budget. So if I spent all this time asking residents to vote between the playground and the basketball court when actually they want both of those things, and really we should be saying, let's just cut the budget for road widening, um, but that's not up for discussion. So rather than spending a lot of time deciding how we divvy up the crumbs and using really democratic processes to divide you know, one slice of the cake, we should be ensuring that we're still fighting for the, the whole cake or the whole bakery or whatever you want, want to call it. So. I'm conscious of time. That's that's basically a rough uh, overview of my thinking at the moment. I'll post links in the chat to a few articles I've written about this topic and links to those websites I just showed you. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you so much, Jono. Um, likewise, some fantastic insights there into your practices and, and thoughts. So thanks so much. Um, I'll hand over now to Rabina Nanyunja, who's an international development expert and environmentalist who is awarded an honorary professorship by the Academic Union of the University of Oxford in Business and Management. She brings on board rich experience in environmentalism, entrepreneurship, international development, business and political leadership, as well as corporate governance. She's the founder and chair of Pilot International, a social enterprise registered in Uganda with networks and partnerships promoting sustainable development in over 100 countries globally. Through Pilot International, she has contributed to institutional capacity development in various businesses, private sector, NGOs, and facilitated an investment within Africa and globally, as well as designing and implementing multinational development, renewable energy, climate change, and innovative projects. She's the first Vice President of the African Greens Federation. It's a pleasure and privilege to have you with us, Robina. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, and uh, good afternoon to all members. Uh, my speech is about uh, how Greens in government, parliaments operating in communities work together to transform <laughs> how governments work. Uh, first of all, in my point of view, I feel like uh, where, for example, uh, Greens are actually in governments because the, the point is different from those that are not in governments. But where they are in governments, I believe that formation of joint green community networks that are capable of uh, drawing programs, um, activities, and uh, generation of uh, maybe policy papers, and submitting all these through the, their representatives in, in, in the governments can really help to influence decisions uh, from the grassroots. Because when you involve the media and you, know, you, you, you have representation, uh, all this really uh, presses demands on the governments uh, to, 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 to take up what you are advocating for. But of course, the challenge here is uh, some parties that are not in government. Uh, for example, my party in Uganda, 
uh, find it difficult really to push their uh, uh, their ideas and decision to influence any decisions in the parliament or even their governments. Um, also, the point here. Uh, sorry, I think I'm, I'm more or less give uh, a case studies in Africa because that's where I have uh, uh, you know most experience. Oh yes, the challenge. There is a challenge actually of uh, radicalism in in Africa versus our new green parties on the African continent. Um, in the in the perspective of uh, Africa, when you are in an opposition, uh, how do the citizens view you? How do they look at you? They look at your capacity to really have a power. And the power maybe that is outside ideas, outside your ideology, the ability to have power and overthrow, overthrow this government or take over power, take over power, of course, uh, democratically from the government. So you find that uh, to attract really such attention also, these radical parties are doing better than the Greens because of their aggression, protests, they are being arrested, they attract free media coverage, you know, like they are being talked about. And uh, to me, they seem like um, their impact, I mean, if an activity is being talked about so much somewhere, then you know that people have bought it, or even when it's nonsense, but are they pe uh, people talking about it? They arrested this one, they released this one on bail, another one is arrested. So basically, if those conversations continue up to election day, uh, the people are going to elect such parties. On whether they deliver or not, that is a different <laughs> story. So these communities, I, I don't know, as Greens, I think, uh, because of course, I'm not saying that we adopt radicalism and that's why we are green, but we have to find ways of working otherwise. In my perspective, uh, our green ideology is a very rich ideology that uh, almost encompasses everything, a lot of programs within the communities, a lot of projects, a lot of, uh, ideas, bit presentations and talks can be really generated <laughs> or embarked on to see that uh, we activate the masses, we activate the masses into conversations so that uh, maybe we, we stick <laughs> in their thoughts, we, we stick in their minds, we can raise the, the, their attention to really see uh, uh, what their needs are on the uh, development perspective and also politically with our with what we believe in uh, peaceful coexistence but we have to we have to generate energy we have to accelerate ourselves yes yeah, so basically now that uh, uh, the benefits of this congress we've uh, come together i hope that the conversations will continue and uh, we begin with these particular networks that have been formed. I mean, these panels have connected us together. These are some of the, uh, of the uh, activities that as Greens can continue with and then see how to work together, how to have programs there, be it advocacy, be it media, presentations. I mean, we, we need really to be seen active and vibrant. So basically that's all uh, that I have to say. If there are any questions, I think there will be a session for that. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, wonderful to have your thoughts. And it's really striking to me with this panel as with others at this Congress, how all around the world, we face such similar circumstances exactly. and challenges. Um, so thank you so much. I'm thank now you. going to introduce Laura Lopez and remind people that we have an interpretation button down the bottom. Um, and we can, those of us who need the English translation can 
um, can use that there. Um, Laura Lopez has been a member of the Spanish Parliament for En Comú Podem since 2019. She graduated in political science at Pompeu Fabra University and has completed master's degrees in public and social policies and sociology and demography. Before being elected to the Congress of Deputies, she worked in the University of Girona doing research on social mobility. She's also worked in public administration, uh, in occupation, public policies and local development plans, and in universities as a research assistant and knowledge transfer technician. She currently collaborates with Open University of Catalonia as a teacher assistant of public economy and welfare at the Economy Analysis Master's degree. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. I'm um, okay, now. So I said thank um, you in English. I I I will speak sorry. Spanish. Sorry, sorry, Laura. Hang on, we can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, no. Uh, I I have the microphone unmuted right now. Can others hear the interpreter? You might have to switch over to the English channel if you're not on that. Uh, you can hear the interpreter. Ah, oh, okay. I'm on the off channel. The so, Laura. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank Go on. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, muchas gracias uh, por organizar este webinar uh, y también muchas gracias por por in, por invitarme y también pues muchas gracias al equipo de de traductores por facilitar pues que pueda hablar español castellano que decimos los catalanes y, y que así nos podemos entender todo. Voy a empezar explicando un poco uh, quiénes somos y de dónde venimos, quiénes somos uh, Cataluña en Cataluña en Comú. Uh, <coughs> Cataluña en Comú uh, nace eh, de un movimiento social, de una demanda ciudadana y tiene eh, los que formamos parte de Cataluña en Comú somos un equipo de personas que algunos sí que venimos ya de otros partidos. En este caso, uno de los uh, partidos uh, que se abocaron en la creación, en la formación de Cataluña en Común, era el llamado Iniciativa para Cataluña Vers. Iniciativa para Cataluña Vers era un partido pionero en Cataluña en defender los valores que representamos el espacio verde y que a su vez uh, procedía del Partido Socialista Unificado de Cataluña, Partido Socialista Unificado de Cataluña, PSU, le conocemos, que era un partido político uh, español, pero que operaba en el ámbito de Cataluña um, y, y que en principio pues, tenía ideología comunista. Este partido existió entre el 36 y el 87. Pero fue en el 95 cuando por primera vez se formó de manera pionera una coalición electoral con los verdes y este partido se pasó lo que se llamaba primero Iniciativa para Cataluña, pasó a nombrarse Iniciativa por Cataluña Vers y no solo fue un cambio de nombre, sino que también supuso un, una evolución en los valores Uh, que perseguía el, el partido y también supuso cambios en, en la estructura interna. Uh, es sabido que cuando hablamos de democracia, el, tenemos que hablar tanto de la democracia interna, ¿no? cómo las organizaciones estructuran, gestionan su toma de decisiones y también pues, la democracia externa. El, el hecho de que se incorporara uh, en, el, en lo que era Iniciativa para Cataluña, Alsvers, Um, supuso esta um, actualización, democratización, internalización de lo que se podría llamar valores postmaterialistas y supuso, como os digo, pues una, una revolución democrática, una integración pionera en, en el sistema político catalán y, y por ende eh, español. Ahora, eh, Iniciativa por Cataluña Vers uh, está diluida, no existe, pero tenemos un partido heredero que se llama uh, Esquerra Verda, 
izquierda verde y, y que tiene como principal objetivo promover los valores que defendemos los partidos verdes y lo hacemos integrados en un espacio político amplio que eh, se llama pues, Cataluña en, en Comú. Um, Cataluña en Comú es, es un partido que primero nació en, en ámbito um, local, en, en Barcelona, y que nace tras las protestas del, del 15M. Eh, tras constatar que el movimiento del, del 15M uh, pedía y creaba una mayoría social, que realmente lo que reclamaba era más soberanía y democracia, la, la formación en ese momento encabezada y todavía, por suerte, por Ada Colau, y se sumaron fuerzas de la izquierda alternativa para relatar, para constatar un nuevo tiempo y a la vez um, heredar la tradición de izquierdas, el catalanismo popular, el feminismo, ecologismo y republicanismo. El movimiento 15M, pues imagino que más o menos todos lo, lo conocemos, pero hago un pequeño resumen. Uh, también uh, se llamaba el movimiento de los indignados y fue un movimiento de raíz ciudadana um, que se formó pues, a raíz de la manifestación que le da nombre al movimiento en 2011, el 15 de mayo. Fue convocada por diversos colectivos donde después que, que varios grupos de personas decidieran acampar pacíficamente en las plazas de distintas ciudades de España y más o menos de forma espontánea y dio lugar a una serie de protestas pacíficas con la intención de promover una democracia más participativa alejada del bipartidismo. Um, el bipartidismo formado por los dos partidos tradicionales de España, en la parte conservadora el Partido Popular y en la parte centro-izquierdas el Partido Socialista. Y alejados del de peso que tenían los lobbies, los bancos, las corporaciones y reclamando también una auténtica división de poderes y sobre todo la mejora del sistema democrático. Um, ahora les cuento un poco el porqué de, del 15M, uh, utilizando las reflexiones de un compañero, también pues, de esta formación político, política que se llama Sergi, Sergi de Maya. El, el 15M fue un, un mito fundacional de lo que se autodenomina la nueva política y, y supone una refundación de, de la izquierda. Si se recordará este movimiento y se identifica, es porque por primera vez desde la transición que tuvimos, la transición, ahora voy a hablar de esto si, si me da tiempo, eh, un conjunto uh, amplio y, y, y diferente de personas pues, se juntaron para reclamar que eh, no solo unas políticas concretas, sino para poner en el centro el cuestionamiento del mismo funcionamiento del, del sistema político. Lo que se decía en las plazas era democracia real, ya le llaman democracia y, y no lo es, o no nos representan. O sea, era una, una crisis, una, una reclamación ciudadana que cuestionaba, ponía en el centro ya no solo qué decisiones se tomaban, sino cómo se tomaban estas, estas decisiones. Um, les hablaba antes de, de por qué llegamos a este momento. Tenemos que tener en cuenta que España fue sometida a una dictadura y que es importante eh, resaltar que esta dictadura tenía un aire católico. O sea, no solo pues, estamos hablando de, de una dictadura de, 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 de derechas, fascista, sino que también pues, está en la base la Iglesia. Esto supone eh, que se negaban los derechos de, de todas las personas en general, pero particularmente se negaban los derechos de las mujeres. En esa época, pues el breadwinner uh, model uh, era lo que imperaba. O sea, el hombre tenía derechos, la mujer no. Se negaban los derechos de la clase trabajadora y se negaban los derechos de todo lo que el régimen, la dictadura, consideraba distinto, diferente. Esto ha provocado que España uh, tenga muy poca tradición democrática, tanto en el funcionamiento estatal, en las raíces del Estado, uh, todavía ahora estamos investigando 
ciertas actitudes estatales, caso Kitchen, casos de corrupción, lo que le llamamos las cloacas del Estado, que provienen de, este, de, de, de la um, costumbre de la dictadura franquista. Pero también uh, ha provocado uh, en las generaciones anteriores una um, falta de de saber incidir en las decisiones públicas y, y, una, y un gran sentimiento de ineficacia política particular. Uh, otra característica que me gustaría resaltar es el, el sistema electoral que tenemos. El sistema electoral uh, que se diseñó tras ese proceso de transición entre la dictadura y la democracia que tenemos ahora um, fue creado para asegurar que este bipartidismo se mantenía y que aquellas fuerzas conservadoras uh, tenían asegurada la mayoría, porque se diseñó de tal manera que los territorios donde sabía que eran de ideología más conservadora um, tuviesen más peso, por lo que el principio una persona, un voto, no se cumple. El, el papel que jugamos los comunes, uh, nosotros, Venimos, como ya les he comentado, por una parte de esta tradición de pionera que son los verdes y por otra parte de movimientos ciudadanos uh, como podría ser uh, la PA. La PA es el movimiento en defensa de la vivienda, para ponerlo así resumido, y uh, contra los desahucios. Es simplemente para citar uno. Y esto pues mm, uh, marca nuestra manera de hacer. Ahora, por ejemplo, eh, como supongo que, que, que habrán sabido, hemos aprobado en el, en el Congreso, eh, antes de ayer pues, hicimos la, la votación en el Congreso de los Diputados, la reforma laboral. Una reforma laboral que tiene dos cosas pues, importantes, eh, no voy a, a incidir mucho en este tema. Una es que devuelve el, el peso a los sindicatos, que los sindicatos puedan defender a los trabajadores, eh, un derecho que se había perdido uh, cuando el Partido Conservador, el Partido de Derechas, llamado Partido Popular, hizo su reforma que quitaba el, de, el derecho de, de los sindicatos en las empresas. Uh, y otra cosa muy importante es que esta reforma se ha hecho contando con la sociedad civil, en este caso representado tanto por las organizaciones, las patronales, um, como con los sindicatos. Esto es muy importante porque, disculpen, esto es muy importante porque eh, no solo se cuenta con información de primera mano, sino porque va a dar estabilidad a esta nueva ley tan beneficiosa para los trabajadores. Uh, asimismo, otra manera que nos que nos define de, de, de cómo continuamos en contacto, cómo recogemos eh, esa um, raíz ciudadana, es el movimiento feminista. Uh, en España continúan habiendo muchas, muchas, muchas diferencias um, entre hombres y mujeres y, y nosotros, pues en, en nuestra raíz, tenemos el, el feminismo como valor. ¿Y cómo lo hacemos? Pues lo hacemos hablando, al lado, formando parte de este movimiento feminista de base de la ciudadanía y gracias a ello pues hemos conseguido aprobar muchas, muchas uh, leyes, uh, tanto en el ámbito estatal como en el ámbito local, um, que recogen el sentir de las mujeres, de ese feminismo y todo el trabajo que se ha venido haciendo en la calle en estos tiempos. Otro ejemplo de cómo recogemos el sentir de la sociedad civil podría ser uh, tanto en el sector ecologista como en el sector de mejora de los transportes sostenibles. Um, nosotros, cuando, tanto en el Estado como en otras instituciones, estamos constanta, constantemente hablando uh, con las organizaciones que promueven el desarrollo del tren en Cataluña, también en España, y también pues, organizaciones mm, medioambientales, como podría ser en el ámbito de, de Girona, la provincia desde le, la que les hablo, um, Sos Costa Brava, uh, que promueve pues, eh, un desarrollo Uh, sostenible de nuestro entorno, una gestión sostenible de nuestros bosques, de, de nuestro imperio uh, natural. Y, y ya para acabar, les quería contar que un valor muy importante para nosotros es que la toma de decisiones tiene que estar lo más cerca de los ciudadanos posible, 
Uh, y es por eso que nosotros mm, somos una fuerza, una fuerza municipalista. Uh, como saben, uh, nuestras dos alcaldías uh, más importantes, aunque tenemos otras, están en Barcelona y en el Prat de Llobregat. Uh, me parece que me estoy pasando de tiempo, así que no les puedo explicar los planes locales de participación de estas dos ciudades, pero sí que les puedo uh, constatar uh, que son muy novedosos y que lo que buscan es realmente no solo tener un protocolo de participación ciudadana, sino que realmente sea efectivo y que cada ciudadano y cada ciudadana um, pueda participar en la toma de decisiones locales y estos sean uh, trasladados, sean realmente efectivos en el cambio en el municipio. Disculpar si me he pasado de tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic to, to hear that um, detailed history um, and your insights on um, you know, the development of this new political movement and, and very dramatic changes um, from dictatorship to deep democracy. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have time now, quite a bit of time for a question and answer session um, with um, attendees. Um, so please, if you have any questions, um, do pop them in the chat there so that um, we can put them to the panelists. Um, one thing that um, while while we're waiting for for other questions, I might um, pass on to each of the panelists for your thoughts is um, in each of your presentations in different ways, I think we heard about um, the the connection to local community being crucial and um, you know representing a a certain local area the the deep engagement that you get from people when talking about changes in a local park and whether there should be a toilet block there um, and you know being on the streets with people so that that direct connection is how you bring in feminist and local politics into it um, I'd be interested in in your thoughts on um, how, as a as a party and as a global party, as a global network of parties, we can use that connection to people and place in our local communities, and um, and connect each other, <coughs> each our communities together in such a way to be a global connected democratic network of communities and parties. Um, any thoughts on on that question from any of you? Who wants to? John, I'm, I'm happy to go. I'm happy to go first. If, yeah, I, I think it's obviously a really core question in terms of our politics and and how we structure ourselves. I think a real opportunity around kind of localizing and decentralizing democracy is that we can engage people through local issues and and struggles on the ground that give people a positive experience of a different form of democracy uh, i guess for most people in the world the idea of directly participating in democratic decision making is often quite a new thing and so the idea of you know being have, able to have a direct say over national government policy might seem a bit too out there for a lot of people but they can imagine having a say on how a local public space is designed and so I, I find that through some of these local decision-making processes that becomes a positive and practical experience of decentralized democracy that then makes it more possible for people to get on board with the idea of scaling that up and transforming democracy at higher levels. So I think, yeah, if we are to be, you know, experimenting with different forms of decentralized decision-making and the idea of like that idea of starting locally makes just so much sense and is really intuitive and accessible for people. Um, and there's a lot of radical potential there that I think often gets overlooked. Uh, even as Greens, we're often really preoccupied with how can we see win seats in the sort of province or the regional or the national government, but um, being able to experiment with and employ different forms of de direct democracy and participatory democracy at the local level um, is a really important framework and foundation because if we're too quick to 
like seize power at the national level without having those good grassroots democratic institutions where too easily co-opted by the system. And I do think we see that with some Greens movements around the world where as they seize power at higher levels of government, um, they default back to a command and control centralised form of decision making um, and replicate the same mistakes that other political parties and movements have made throughout history. So really insisting on a strong local de democratic foundation is especially important in that context. Very valuable warning. Thank you. Um, Maggie, response from you. Thanks very much, uh, Tim. And yeah, I, I agree and echo what, what Jono has just said. I think we we are in Scotland, we are fighting some of that at the moment. It's it's just so much so much easier for the small group of us to make all the decisions because we, we're in the same place, or actually even leave some of the decision making up to one or two people who are in the room at the same time. And yeah, guarding against that is 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 hard, is, is difficult. And I think that's that's where you know, learn, learning or, or hearing the experiences of, of how Greens are doing it elsewhere is, is really valuable. W w one of the things that I, I wanted to say on this, I was struck, and I've been thinking quite a lot about how the, the, how the climate, uh, the global climate campaign has changed over the last two years, particularly perhaps the, the school climate strikes, the Fridays for Future climate strikes, and how that had nothing to do with party politics. It had nothing to do with, you know, formal structured politics, even, even the formal structures of participatory um, and deliberative uh, politics. It was about, uh, in, 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 in the, the climate strikes, uh, one, one, young, one young woman saying, actually, no, we, we, uh, you know, she needed to take a stand and, and other people joined her. And I think one of the things that we need to be we need to work on it. I'm not sure we're there yet, but is the narrative, the story around that kind of linking of people's lives with politics, because I think democracy and politics has become so alien to folk. That's what that's what capitalism does. It, it alienates us from, from decision making. It alienates us from, from power. And I think that's that there's a lot for us to learn in those kinds of very, very clearly non um, party political movements, and I think that the very structure of party politics actually is 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 one one of our own own worst enemies at times. Not not only because of that centralizing and con command and control nature that that Jono's mentioned, but just just the the exclusion of the rest of the world, the exclusion of the rest of life in, in, in them. In many ways, you know, when when I started out um, my my I talk this morning, I talked about 129 people being elected to represent and to make decisions for a country of over 5 million. I mean, that's just ridiculous how, you know, that the representative, representative democracy we know doesn't, doesn't achieve what we want to achieve. And we need to ensure that we don't in, in bringing in uh, participative and deliberate, deliberative processes into the representative space, we don't replicate the same alienation. And I think some of the examples that John has talked about it are, are, are really, really good. And I'm, I'm definitely going to spend a little bit more time poking around that website because I think there's a lot for us to, 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 to learn from there. So, but, but, but I think it's, for, for me, it comes down to telling stories and Greta Thunberg school kids around the world have a very, very powerful story to tell. And politicians often don't. And I think it's it's being able to invert who's telling the story or, or who has the power, who has the platform to tell the story. That's that's really, really important. So we have to open up spaces around, we have to open up conversations about our media. We have to open up conversations about education. It, 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 it feeds into every element of public and, and, and civic life. And I think, those connections also take time, they take effort, they take work to, to get right. And we don't have that much time, do we? We, 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 we face a, a global climate emergency. So yeah, it's tough. But, but I think these kinds of events actually are, are really, really important to share ideas, share learning, share what doesn't work as well. So we don't have to repeat everybody else's mistakes. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, Laura, did you have any reflections on on this question? I'd be interested in how um, you translate the work of of 
the local en commun movement to the national Spanish parliament as well. Sí, yo, bueno, respecto a la primera pregunta, uh, quería hacer también en, en un, un comentario que creo que va muy en la línea de lo que comentaba Maggie. Yo creo que en el, en el núcleo de, de los valores de los partidos verdes está el que sabemos que no hay un binomio entre humanidad y naturaleza, ¿no? porque todos formamos parte de este ecosistema biológico. Esto mismo tenemos que explicarlo a la sociedad, que tampoco existe un binomio entre individuo y uh, sociedad, porque uh, es lo mismo, el individuo forma parte de la sociedad. En este uh, sentido, yo creo que tenemos que hacer un trabajo muy importante de empoderamiento y concienciación. Um, yo, por ejemplo, bajando en el plano local, cuando si un niño me pregunta qué es la, la política, yo siempre contesto qué es las decisiones comunitarias de las personas que permiten que cuando salen del portal de su casa tengan o no una farola. Y creo que es esta concienciación de que las explicar que entre todos podemos decidir cómo queremos que sean nuestras comunidades, nuestras relaciones con los vecinos y nuestras ciudades. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, Robina, are you still with us? Would you like to comment on this question too? Oh, yes. Uh, but I see that my video doesn't accept. I hope that's okay. Sure. Please go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. So the question uh, I wanted to contribute about the global networks of uh, communities in parties. Uh, I think this is uh, really very, very possible. And uh, given that we already connected globally through the Green parties, the Green parties in different countries uh, have a structure. Okay, at least uh, they have some structures. I'll give an example from the African uh, Green parties because where I am the first vice president, they have a couple of networks uh, for example, the young greens, they, they are the women greens, they are the, they are, you know, uh, different, inter, for example, inter, entrepreneurship leagues, various, various really networks around the green parties that, uh, you know, can be correlated with our uh, sister parties uh, elsewhere and really see how to collaborate and work together and establish this uh, local community, local government, uh, uh, green, green movement among the Greens, among the Green parties. Thank you. Thank you. There's a really excellent question popped up in the chat from, um, from Gavin McCall, which I'd like to put to the panelists, asking, what sort of practical mechanisms can Green parties adopt to ensure that our members who are elected to public office are not captured by the system, but at the same time, not create a suspicious and hostile division between parliamentarians and councillors who are our comrades and our membership? That's, I think, such a crucial, crucial question that I'm sure many of us in our parties around the world have been grappling with. Um, any thoughts? Who shall I go to first? Uh, Robina, you still have your audio on. Would you like to talk about that? Oh, oh yes. Uh, actually, yeah, it's a very, very interesting question because uh, it's a, a challenge, uh, I think, elsewhere, as you said. Uh, but I will share, for example, our situation in uh, Uganda or Africa. So if you have a vibrant, for example, you have a vibrant green uh, politician, activist with brains, you know, you know, someone that is attractive there, uh, the ruling governments tend to give offers, you know, offers, join our party, we will do this and this, we'll give you this and this. Um, in my perspective, for example, in my country, I haven't been, uh, I'm not an elected politician, 
but uh, I think I've participated before in uh, elections and I've uh, gotten a lot of advances really from uh, the ruling party and also other political parties that really see, yes, this woman is very broad, maybe she needs a, a more developed party. But I say that I've never really even, I would say the reason why I'm actually in politics, I think it's because of the Greens. So we need really to, uh, the, the elected Greens really have, of course, to have some ethics, they have to, to keep strong and see that yes, uh, Rome wasn't built in one day, even if we have one or two, uh, two members of parliament or even in none like us, you know, we continue uh, with, the, with the motivation, we continue promoting, we continue featuring, we continue engaging. It all goes back really to the ethics and, uh, you know, the determination of, uh, of the members who are in government there. But I understand it's very, very challenging on the side of the, of the green parties uh, and also maybe the elected Greens that since our parties are still small and you know they don't have financial resources, when our members reach there, they are given big offers. I mean, they've struggled through their campaigns. Maybe they've used the personal resources for that case. And then, you know, here is, uh, you know, government offer this and that. So it's very difficult also uh, to, to resist it. Yeah, but still we have to really to have the strength and motivation and determination that uh, this is a, a legacy we are building. We are not building it in one year, five years, 10 years, but we are building it forever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, would you like to take that question? Yeah, thank, thanks, Tim, and thanks to Gavin for the question. I think uh, Rubina has talked very, very clearly about the challenges around both uh, time and resources, money. I think that, that those are always going to be pressures for that, that limit or, or that restrict or constrain um, th th that relationship, because essentially, and, and Lara talked about this earlier, she talked about the, the relationships that we have um, more generally with our communities, but I think the same is true of the relationships between elected representatives and um, party membership. I think fundamentally for, for me, it comes down to um, two things, one, one, being, one being about trust. I think elected representatives have to work to, to gain the trust of, of their party membership. I think quite often that's expected or assumed, and that's I think that that assumption is, is is problematic, and so so that's about building um, open channels of communication, open channels of challenge as well. And for both sides, and maybe it's problematic to to set it up as a binary, but but for for the elected representatives to acknowledge when they've got things wrong, and for the um, for, for the wider community party membership. Uh, uh, representative communities that that um when, when when they have have maybe been very very vocal about something that's actually inhibited change elsewhere that recognition is hard you know it's not something that many human beings take take well or or or, or, or find easy but i think fundamentally for me it comes down to to building building trust and having having communications that aren't are, are, are always are, are, that always function in good faith and good faith politics is rare and it's it's um it, it makes it makes people vulnerable as well and we don't certainly certainly in the uk um we don't have a political system that enables or supports or allows vulnerability and I think that's part of the culture that that, that we need to change uh, that that I think I, I'm hopeful that greens being being elected representatives at different levels will will help to contribute to changing but yeah it, it's it's building that culture change building that trust building that those communications at a time rec when we can recognize the constraints of time money e everything else that's going on trust really is core to the whole project isn't it thank you so much for that um laura can i pass to you now 
Gracias por la pregunta y por darme palabra y gracias a los compañeros por las respuestas porque realmente se aprende escuchando. Um, yo como les voy a contar desde mi experiencia como, como representante, como diputada en el Congreso, um, yo tengo dos cosas uh, muy claras. Una, um, que no soy la diputada Laura López, soy la representante del espacio que casuísticamente me llamo Laura López. Uh, ¿no? O sea, solo soy una pieza más en el engranaje. Eh, desde la experiencia les tengo que contar que incluso a veces eh, he votado algo con lo que como persona Laura López no estoy de acuerdo, pero como pieza del engranaje de lo que pensamos la colectividad sí que estoy de acuerdo. Y por tanto, mmm, como tengo claro que yo estoy ahí como pieza, yo voto incluso siendo que la, mi persona no, no está de acuerdo. Otra cosa que eh, creo que es muy importante son los espacios de, de diálogo. Creo que esto mmm, es bueno para mmm, crear la confianza que, que, a la que se refería Maggie, porque si yo como militante de base no estoy de acuerdo con esta decisión, pues yo, mmm, no voy a, a manifestar mi desacuerdo como representante, sino que lo haré en los espacios de diálogo creados para ello. Si tenemos espacios de diálogo donde todo el mundo puede participar, los representantes luego podemos coger este diálogo y ser conscientes de, de, de esta representación. Thank you so much. Um, John O. Yeah, I really enjoyed everyone else's answers and picking up on that same theme, I think just reiterating the importance of in order to main trust between the elected representatives and the people i think it's really important to be having strategic debates out in the open as much as possible and i think that's really what lara was talking about with this idea of dialogue is that often even particularly with other establishment political parties there's a strong tendency for all the difficult discussions about when to compromise and when to stick to your principles they all happen behind closed doors And sometimes I think Greens representatives are tempted to do that as well, because it, we don't want to show disunity in the public sphere. We want to look like we all agree 100%. And so those debates about, oh, what should our position be? Or should we agree to this concession? Or should we take a hard line, et cetera? If all that happens in, in private, then the membership is left in the dark and the broader popular base of the party is left in the dark. And that's what builds distrust And I think makes it harder for a it makes it harder for people to hold their members accountable, but it also um, means that the members are going to be perceived to be co-opted by the establishment, whether they are or not. So I think it's really important to continually insist on the importance of strategy, strategic debates happening out in the open. If if the average sort of member or Greens voter doesn't know why an MP has voted a so certain way or can't understand or find out why the elected representatives have picked a certain position that's really destabilizing to the movement so yeah we need to be comfortable with having those messy debates out in the public even where it might seem to like reflect badly at, at first glance actually it's healthier for the party in the long term that's something i've been thinking about a lot and discussing with greens here in australia um is that that tendency for us to believe in the the old political line that disunity in politics is death and therefore we can't disagree with that with our own colleagues and our um co-members of the party in public and we have to have these discussions behind closed doors i very very strongly disagree with that and agree with you john o that i think the more we have these conversations in public and, and in the open as long as we have them in a constructive, deliberative way where we're actually talking to each other and seeking to, uh, to reach consensus, then that's an extremely healthy thing to do. Um, uh, there was a question that you actually raised yourself, Jono, which I think is a, a useful one for us to discuss, um, which often comes up in these kinds of questions around the Um, the intersection of representative and parliamentary democracy and participatory democracy around majority rules, majority decision-making, working towards consensus, 
how do we seek to um to find a way through there um between yeah voting decision making which is going to be working on a simple majority basis um and trying to find uh a balance uh that that ensures that the minority voices don't get excluded which so often happens um i'd be interested in yeah i mean jono do you want to go first and kind of expand on your your question and your thinking there i mean i think you nailed it but yeah really the tension i've found is that sometimes even when you have a consensus based or a, a fairly inclusive decision making process um perhaps people who are more privileged will be more likely or able to participate um, or maybe there's just more of them in general um, and so you end up sometimes with situations where an oppressed minority is simply being dis marginalized or um, ignored um, and I, I guess yeah it's a tricky tension for us as Greens if we say we're committed to democracy and we're com committed to um, respecting kind of the, the results of the process what do we do when the process says actually too bad for the renters we want house prices to continue rising what, what do we do in that situation should we be saying actually no no we're, we don't care about the democratic process we're still going to uphold the rights of this minority um I'm, i'd be really interested in maggie and how you navigated that with the renters rights um stuff you've been exploring like did you have heaps of homeowners say no we don't like this or and and did that mean that um you kind of had to ignore them Th th thanks for that that question Jonna. um in, in some ways we're lucky in the scottish greens because we, we are a party of the left and we don't hold much truck with landlords so so people who are landlords um who 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 are very vocal and very oppositional to to quite a lot of the the green uh the, the new deal for tenants that that we we have in the cooperation agreement we we I think it's probably fair to say we've kind of cut our losses. We know we're not going to get them on board on that. Um, we don't need them on board to get this through. You know, we are where we are, so so we can work we can work with it. But I think I think one of one of the interesting things, and 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 this is maybe a really good example of of the value of participatory approaches, particip participatory budgeting, and, and and that kind of thing, because. Where, where where there is time and and this has been borne out in some of the citizens assemblies that have been done a, a, around the world i'm thinking i think primarily of the very very difficult decisions that ireland had to take on equal marriage and on abortion you know very very strong religious arguments and religious communities set up against both equal marriage and and abortion and yet after that process of proper information proper open discussion even those who walked into the room very very against the idea said yes this is the right thing to do and i think you know we we don't have we don't have the time to do that to make the spaces for those discussions in in every decision we have to make and that's part of the problem but i think there's also there's also something else in 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 that question for me and that's around um the, the toxicity that is created by bad faith actors and i find i find that one of the most frustrating things because there are people who will never engage in good faith and yet they are there they are part of our political process they are members of hopefully not our own parties but they they are in the the parliaments or the councils or the chambers that that we 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 inhabit and i think th there's an element to which you know we we, ju we just cut our losses with them as well because it, there's no point in wasting effort and energy on them but we can't always do that and i think that our, our political structures our democratic structures don't have an answer for yet and and i I'd, I'd be interested to hear if, if if anybody thinks we do have answers for for, for that yet, um, and, and if it is if it is quite simply, although this is difficult to do, but quite simply to get more people to to engage with and understand, and take and and have the possibility of taking power over their lives, and then actually those bad faith actors don't have the power that they currently have now, and obviously that's I think what we're all we're all trying to achieve in 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 our, our respective green parties, but yeah that that's that's frustrating. 
Very much so, hugely important questions and, and the kinds of questions that people have been grappling with, of course, in, in this space for a very long time. And in some ways, if I can just briefly respond to that, I think, you know, my reading of Eleanor Ostrom's work and, 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 and many people like that and indigenous um, democratic spaces, almost the more participatory and deliberative you make your decision-making processes, the, the easier it is actually in a sense to, to deal with some of those toxic players because you can temporarily exclude people on that basis from that kind of process and say, to be involved in this decision-making process, you must abide by our agreed rules and then welcome them back when they're ready to do so. Whereas with a voting system, I think none of us would ever say, you can't vote <laughs> if you behave like that. So it actually creates a different, the different mode of decision-making almost creates a, an, e an easier space to deal with those kinds of people, perhaps if we can do it well. Um, Laura, can I invite you to reflect on this question of? Yo quería uh, aprovechar, uh, bueno, voy a contestar una pregunta del chat um, técnica porque no, no, no puedo escribir. Eh, sí, escucho el, el original también y el, y el español, cosa que va bien porque también así me ayuda a interpretar. Perdón, ahora vuelvo a la, a la cuestión. Um, quería destacar dos cosas que, para que conozcamos una irregularidad uh, en España y también para que seamos conscientes del papel como Partidos Verdes. Creo que es muy importante una cosa que hemos hecho, tanto si estamos llegando a formar gobierno en algunos sitios como formando parte de las instituciones o no, y perdón si me voy un poco del tema, pero creo que es interesante. Creo que tenemos que ser muy conscientes que un gran logro de los Partidos Verdes es que hemos puesto el ecologismo encima de la mesa. Es decir, ahora uh, las corporaciones, uh, las empresas, los, incluso los partidos Uh, conservadores um, quieren ponerse la máscara de que son partidos verdes y, y creo que esto es muy importante para, para nosotros. También quería contar, ya les he hablado antes de las irregularidades del sistema electoral español um, que realmente hace que los territorios conservadores tengan más peso en en convertir en escaños los votos de las personas y esto pro provoca que realmente hayan ciertas minorías que nunca puedan uh, alcanzar una representación política um, porque eh, se fomenta el, el bipartidismo. Y aparte, pues hay el umbral de voto, pues que en cierta, depende del tipo de elección, es un 3 o un 5%, que también va en contra de, de las minorías y por tanto, pues vamos incentivando cada vez más lo que les comentaba del senti el propio sentimiento de eficacia política y que hace que realmente la desafección política de los ciudadanos y las ciudadanas sea cada vez uh, mayor. Uh, la otra cosa que quería comentar como una irregularidad democrática muy importante en España y que nosotros como Partido Verde siempre pues estamos uh, poniendo sobre la mesa es que las personas que viven en nuestros pueblos y ciudades pero que vienen uh, de otros sitios si no están administrativamente regulados no pueden participar en las votaciones locales. Creo que es uh, nuestro papel importante reclamar que esto sea así y que mientras no consigamos cambiarlo, que al menos nosotros les proporcionemos espacio para que ellos puedan manifestar sus opiniones de cómo tiene que ser la ciudad y, y, y de las relaciones entre la comunidad. Absolutely crucial points. We, we have had a very similar discussion um, here in Australia with the, um, due to the pandemic again most recently, um, where a lot of non-citizens non and temporary residents were excluded from welfare, in fact, um, as well as excluded from work and had no democratic say, of course, in, in how to confront that. Uh, so it was a reminder, I think, for a lot of people of that exclusion from the democratic process of quite a large number of people in our society. Um, Robina, can I invite you to reflect on that question too, please? Uh, 
Do we still have you? Yes, uh, you're muted, I'm afraid. Can you just give me a brief highlight, sorry, to of the question? Uh, that's all right. Yes, we're I mean we're discussing the broadly the question of the the intersection between how as rep, in representative democracy we um, are working in a majority rules system basically, um, whereas in grassroots democratic politics we're seeking consensus and we're seeking to involve every voice and how we kind of manage this uh, this tension really. Um, between um, in decision making, between ensuring minority voices are heard and ensuring we get every voice as uh, to the table um, within a within a majority rule system. Oh yes, uh, of course. Uh, I think this goes back to what I presented that there is a uh, there is a need for collaboration. You know, allowing creating some kind of channels of uh, how people can work together, uh, allowing the minority coming on board, maybe through, uh, through activities, through uh, programs that enable them to express themselves, uh, perhaps involving the media, and even if they are not really in government or whatever, but there should be a platform uh, for them to participate. Uh, for example, in my country, there is a, a, a forum for, for parties who are not in, in a parliament, but still, although there, there are some limitations of, of who participates, but there is that kind of platform where people are, you know, have a recognized kind of structure to go and uh, uh, talk about anything, their grievances and that kind of thing. And then uh, within that uh, parties that are not in the government, there is kind of a board or representation that can channel some ideas to the government. It's a little complicated <laughs> and sometimes it doesn't work, but if it can work anyway, or if we the Greens can form such and we make them work, I think it's a good way. It's a good way for collaboration. It's a good way for inclusion. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, fascinated to hear that that exists. I've, I've heard of some other examples um, in Belgium, for instance, of a standing, a standing citizens assembly, which is tasked with uh, consulting widely across the community to help set the agenda of the parliament and things like that. It's fascinating how these ideas are starting to grow around the world and, and very inspiring really to see where they're happening. Mm -hmm. um, we have about 10 minutes to go folks if we if we want to to keep going. Um, we don't have any other questions in the chat. I, I will invite again any attendees who've got experiences that they want to share please raise your hand or any of the panel members if you'd like to ask other questions of each other please uh, please do so of course. Otherwise, we can um, we can wrap a little bit earlier. Um, but I'll open it to the floor briefly. I was going to ask whether Maggie and and the Scottish Greens, do you poll your members in when you're deciding how you'll vote in Parliament, or how do you engage members in those decisions? Uh <laughs> That, that, that's a great question, Jono, and the easy answer is no, we don't. It, it's something that um, I think we, 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 need to, we need to, we are starting to think about how we, how we do that sort of direct engagement. Um, we, we, have a, we have a pretty comprehensive policy document that we use as our, as our reference guide, and if there are things, if there are decisions that are coming up that aren't, that aren't specifically um, in that, the the idea is that we go back to our values. You know, what 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 are the values as Greens, and 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 where would we fall to that? I think the cooperation agreement has shifted that a little bit because there are there are certain things because with, with with the agreement with the the collective responsibility that our two MSPs who are ministers have. One of the things that there's there's kind there's kind of been a, a what, what's what's the word there's 
th there's been a, a, a decision taken as a group, although we, we've maybe not really talked through this decision as, as a group of parliamentarians properly, but that we won't split the group. So the five of us who are not ministers won't vote differently from the two who are. And I don't know that that will hold for the next four and a half years. I think there will be some things that are very, very difficult. And, and we decide that actually it's okay to, to, to split on that. But I think, I think we probably need to have those discussions as, as a wider party. And, you know, in, in some ways, the, the, the elections were last May. So we're not even, what does that mean? We're not even nine months into, into um, this, this term of parliament, never mind the, the agreement. We signed the agreement in September. So, you know, it, we, 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 we're coming up for, for six months of, of, of the agreement and we, we're learning. We're learning where the things that actually we need to, we need to rely, uh, we, we, who we need to rely on for, cer for certain things. We're still learning how, how to build the structures that we need to make sure we do, we do engage party members. Um, I think there are significant challenges that, you know, we've already faced. We, the, we, we, are, we are in the middle of a budget process. Our budget gets uh, voted on next Thursday. And there are things in there that are uncomfortable for us that if we were in opposition, you know, completely no agreement, it would be very easy for us to say, well, we don't agree with this. And I think, I think the next few, few months, we, we, we are going to need to start thinking quite carefully about how we embed those structures and processes that do enable us to go back to our membership and say, either what, what do we do here, that, that direct question, you be our guide on this, or this is going to be really awful, and we're sorry, but we, we're going to do it anyway, because we get you know, th this further down the line, that that kind of tension that Laura was talking about the the personal, you know, personal vote versus being part of being part of the machine. We, we don't we don't have that sorted yet. And we probably won't in the next four years. It's there, there's always stuff that we can learn. And I think being okay with learning as you go is not something that that politics likes very much. It's not something that in democracy is, or, or, or certainly the, the, the de democratic structures that we have at the moment, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well. You know, you're not allowed to change your mind as a politician. You're not allowed to, to do a U-turn, otherwise you are ridiculed. You, you, you know, you are, you are seen as less powerful. And I, I think working within that quite defensive culture makes for some of those, makes those, some of those conversations really difficult. Thank you so much. Um, I, I love that honesty in that approach. Um, and I think it really, my experience in door knocking, for instance, and speaking to people in the community about the things that, for instance, the Greens in coalition government here in the Australian Capital Territory have been doing, is that when you talk to people who are, who are disappointed with something the Greens have done, and you're completely honest, and you say, look, you know, you, you get a balance here. You get some really great things done because of the Greens in power, but the Greens are the smaller party in government and we actually then have to support a whole lot of things that we actually do disagree with. And it's difficult, but we weigh up the costs and benefits and to be able to go back to your members and say, look, this is going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be things that are happening here that we aren't going to like any of us. But in balance, we think this is the right choice. Do you agree? I think that honesty is really um, will be rewarded, I have to say. I think um, in politics, it generally is. Um, I might ask each of you to give a really brief one to two minute kind of wrap of your thoughts at this point before we, before we close down for the evening. Um, Shall we go um, in the in the same order we we started with, Maggie? Can I ask you to? Yeah, th thank thanks very much, Tim. And can I just start off by saying thank you so much to my fellow panelists, to to people who've been asking questions in the chat. It's 
it's been a really, really interesting discussion, and I've learned an awful lot. And I, I've, I've, take, I've been taking notes and scribbling things down that I can go away and, and think about in in more detail over the next um, over the coming uh, weeks. I, I think for me, what one of the things that is something that I I do I, I struggle with is that tension between um, the desire to be as participative and deliberative as we can be, and the 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 fact that we never have the time to do that in, in the way we want. And I think for what that comes down to at, at its most fundamental level is the culture of decision making. And because we've had in the UK decades, decades upon decades of the elite being left to make all the decisions for everybody, there is no, th there is no popular resistance against that. Or if there is, it's a very, very small um, voice that, that that resistance feels quite small. So I think we re we really are we're really talking about culture change here. We're talking about culture change not only in the types of decisions we make, you know, uh, focusing, you know, le letting minority sorry letting minority voices speak, le letting uh, minority interests actually take precedence that that that's a huge huge culture change in, in the in the types of decisions but also in the quality of how we make those decisions and i think at a time in in, in some ways that, that it would be much easier if we weren't in in the midst of a global pandemic a very very uh difficult um e economic time not only in the uk i think globally and and where global politics are so so tense and so fragile in in, in many ways and i think you know m maybe maybe it's at these points of crisis where we we can actually get the kinds of culture change that we we need more quickly than than we might otherwise but they aren't not painful they, they don't come without pain and I think that there's something for us in Scotland to be very, very mindful of is, you know, we have we have significant challenges facing fa facing the world that we directly contribute to the, the North Sea oil and gas fields being being a very, very clear example. And at, at the same time, we have, you know, hugely unequal communities, hu you know, in one of the richest countries on the earth, we have people dying of starvation and balancing those two very very different challenges i think is make makes makes the need for that culture change all the all the more urgent but it also means that there are things that we should and have to do right now you know and and balancing the now versus the 5 10 years time is 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 complex and but yeah uh, sorry, that was a bit of a ramble. I suppose you know that that tension between culture change and the urgency of what we face at, at the different scales, and the tension between um, engagement and just getting on and doing it because we 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 know we think we know it's the right thing to do. I think that th those are the tensions that that I wrestle with every day. But thank you. It's been a really really interesting session. Thank you so much, Jono. Very brief. Yeah, I think that that tension is a really interesting one that Maggie referred to and we should be always really cautious of assuming that it is better to rush ahead and do the thing because it's urgent and we just have to get it done I would argue and I would offer the idea that in situations where Greens reps are forced to make a tough choice and given a ridiculous deadline um, it is actually often better to abstain or to refuse to vote and say, no, we need more time. We insist on taking the time to talk to the people or to talk to the membership or to consult more democratically. And that, that is actually a healthier and better thing to do than to feel backed into a corner and say, okay, we're just gonna vote because it's urgent and we've got no time. It is, it's better to abstain and to refuse to be co-opted into the narrow parameters of debate and rushed decision-making. It's much better to take the time and insist on proper dem democratic decisions. Thank you. Um, Robina, final brief thoughts. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Tim, for, for moderating uh, this session and thanks to my fellow panelists. So in my point of view, in reflection also to what I talked about, 
I believe it's very important for us to nurture these democratic ecologies. Um, we are still a long way, but we, we are already there and we continue uh, being part of this global network. Let's nurture it and uh, keep sharing and uh, you know getting the motivation. So me, when I saw the Scottish Greens on Facebook, I've been following them and uh, they had a breakthrough to government. I think I'm the first person who made a comment that yes, you've inspired us. So yes, we, uh, we can learn some lessons, uh, you know, share some lessons among each other and uh, share experiences and also see See where, where to change. Yes, we are in the different environments and culture and continents, but as Greens, I think there is a lot that we can share and learn from each other. So I'll be really happy to, to stay connected uh, to all of you and I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you so much. And Laura, final thoughts? Uh, voy a intentar uh, ser breve, que me parece que vamos mal de tiempo. Así que a modo de conclusión, uh, quiero destacar uh, lo que ha dicho Maggie, que es muy importante, el, el seguir aprendiendo y el seguir mejorando, ser conscientes de cuando nos equivocamos. Eh, nosotros como partido tenemos uh, que gestionar la diversidad y tenemos diversidad territorial y diversidad Uh, por ejemplo, pues en temas de, de feminismo o en temas de eh, ecologismo, uh, ¿no? que yo qué sé, uh, uh, perdón, el, parques eólicos, macro parques eólicos, hay muchas visiones distintas dentro del ecologismo y tenemos pues que, que gestionar también esta diversidad de opiniones, o sea, diversidad territorial y diversidad pues más de, 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 de teoría. Uh, y creo que todavía estamos aprendiendo cómo gestionar esta diversidad. Y, y la otra cosa creo que también es difícil es que no solo tenemos que escuchar respuestas a las preguntas que planteamos, sino que la principal dificultad es en escuchar las preguntas que nosotros no nos hacemos. Y creo que en eso también tenemos que seguir avanzando. Dicho esto, muchas gracias. Ha sido muy interesante, muy enriquecedor y espero tener la oportunidad pues, de continuar debatiendo estos temas pues, en otro marco, aunque no sea en un webinar. Muchas gracias a todos y a todas. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, like all of the panelists, I have learned a lot and, and had a fantastic conversation. Thank you, everybody, for agreeing to take part. Enormous thanks to Fernando and Maria, our translators, who, who made this possible, um, to Millie and others at the Global Greens, of course, for um, all of your support in arranging and making this entire Congress happen. Um, so, yes, wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely day, evening, night, wherever you are on this planet and look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Good night. <laughs>